Before I start my talk, I would like to take the time to say a special thank you to Elizabeth Hobson of Justice for Men and Boys for inviting me to speak in this year's International Conference for Men's Issues. I would also like to thank Peter Wright of Gynocentrism.com for his correspondence and his helpful feedback with all my efforts as well as being a mentor of sorts to me. Both of these individuals have been nothing but encouraging and helpful to me as I am a relative newcomer to the men's movement and I'm honored to be considered worthy to deliver a talk in such a key event and speak alongside many, so many brilliant, defining voices. Once again, thank you. The title of this talk is called In Praise of the Self-Interested Competitive Male. I will talk about the competitive male a little later on, but I can already tell that the idea of the self-interested male, or rather the praise of the idea, uh, is raising some eyebrows. Instead of beating around the bush and fishing for euphemisms and apologetics as so as to offending no one, why not say it out loud? I praise the self-interested male. No apologies. Here is my case for it. I make the argument for the self-interested male on the basis of unabashed individualism and never on the basis of collectivism of any sort. I make the argument for individualism on the basis that the individual is the center of a, tr a human being's true identity as only he can realize it. That it is the source of his actions as guided by his own volition and th free will as applied in the real world. That it means the answer to his question of his own significance in existence and in the universe. This, what I call the importance of being I, cannot be understated for the human individual. And I derive from this that self-interest is not only moral, but of utmost moral standing. The collectivist sees the individual as a fibrillation of the alleged harmony of the whole, and seeks to subjugate the individual to its own ends, under the propagation of the convenient lie that it is for the greater good. Do not confuse this parasitic subjugation for true self-interest, however, as self-interest is honest, aiming to be self-sufficient in its practice, and expects no less of others to do the same. Individualism is not about this rule applies for me, but not for thee. No, individualism is a worldview. That for an individual, which we all are, we have to all recognize the importance of being I, and respect one another for being their own I. I distinguish being I from a phenomenon I see many used to describe those that seek to undermine anything from political individual liberty to men's rights. That is the idea of me, me, me. I am going to refer to this sort of thing as what about me or what about meism, mostly because saying me, me, me throughout the talk sounds stupid on my part. I cannot help but doubt that those who use this descriptor against feminists, socialists, SJWs, and the woke crowd, and other opportunists who are all rightly deserving of being ripped for their ridiculous premises, mind you, do so on the basis that these people are being selfish, as they call it. More to the point than my initial praise of the self-interested male, I dare say I praise the selfish male. No doubt this requires an explanation, and there is. Throughout the consciousness of our lives, the word selfish has been describing, in a disparaging way, those that focus on themselves, perhaps at the expense of others. Or has this truly been so? Has it not been true that selfish has also been a descriptor of those who do things simply for their own sake, not interfering in any way, nor in the service of others. In fact, more often than not, selfish has been used by the parasites among us to describe somebody that isn't servicing him or her at the, their beck and call. Has nobody thought it strange that society consistently calls selfish those who peacefully do their own thing, and not those that demand instead that people do for others with themselves, usually at the front of the line, in their minds? Why is it selfish to do one for, for oneself, but not selfish to make others do for you? I advocate outright that the selfish label should be worn as a badge of honor, if you are doing your own thing, or dare I say it, dare I say it going your own way. Yes, no doubt men who go their own way, or MG Tao, are derided as selfish by not only the anti-male segments of society, but ironically the allegedly anti-feminist, allegedly pro-masculine men and women, prattling endlessly, that if a man doesn't actively seek to service womankind or enter into a marriage, they are pathetic weasels, 
or to hear the abjectly obnoxious conservative Tommy Lahren speak, boys who think they're men. If you are a man going your own way, I suggest you not succumb to apologetics about how you aren't being selfish. If you are brave enough to stand against the anti-self sentiment held by society and even unfortunately, unfortunately by some professing to speak for men, perhaps you should consider owning up to being selfish and proudly proclaim that's precisely what you are and that there's nothing wrong with it. Even if you don't adopt the label or all aspects of MG Tao, I still extend the suggestion to you. You, are, you, as a man and an individual, have a right to exist for your own sake. You are right, as a man and as an individual, to exist for your own sake. You are not obliged to sacrifice yourself to a gynocentric society that prefers you as a disposable tool for a means to their ends. What is meant, in turn, by what about me is a call to altruism, that is, a way to demand upon a producer or creator to make themselves a slave towards the needs of those who are not. And those who are not would be the ones crying, what about me? Like an incapable infant wailing for attention and the care of the parent. The infant has an excuse, the adult has not. It is clear from the get-go that those who would make such demands are incapable of providing their own solutions, their own resources, or their own directions for themselves. They are absolutely not to be confused with the individualist, the self-interested human being. This demand of the altruism of others is untenable and an anathema for an individualist who both does for himself and other, honors the right of others to do the same. The one who cries for, what about me, is a collector of spoils, that which it has not earned. To call this selfish, that is, self-interested, is an insult to the one who wishes to exist and live on his own terms. The self is uninvolved for those that exist at the expense of other selves. I have brought up all I have to this point to signify everything that is under siege by gynocentric collectivism. Men in particular are attacked for anything from going their own way and achieving for their own sake and not for society at large or for women, to just doing their own thing and expressing their masculinity in multifaceted ways that even some in the, males, uh, in the men's movement don't cover everything about. Gynocentrism is the demand of male altruism. Gynocentrism is the collector of spoils from the ruins inflicted on mankind by those that resent it, or leech off it, or both. The next time you rightly criticize a feminist, be it uncon the unconsciously casual manipulated sort, or the directly malevolent elitist sort, uh, of indulging in what-about-me behavior, consider that they, all, they have nothing to do with serving the self in any proper sense. They wish to leech off men, as well as gullible self-identified feminists, instead of growing of their own efforts. They wish to expand their own groups and collectives at the expense of their, coll their collectives' own members, and they wish to blame everybody except themselves when their house of cards start to fall apart. The practitioners of what about meism are merely akin to a petulant child that should have long outgrown its infancy. The practitioners of individualism and true selfishness and self-interest are wise enough to have seen past the arbitrary expectations of a society that refuses to understand and respect them as individuals. These individualist men not only live the way they see fit, but accept the responsibilities and consequences associated with it. Be it due to a rabid feminist deriding every breath you, as a man, take in your life, or the traditionalist gynocentric just busybody professing to esteem masculinity, but only its stone-faced utilitarian aspects to siphon energy and resources off of instead of its own sake as a lovable and yet inscrutable quality of men and boys, the self-interested male is attacked, and men, as well as their advocates, sadly resort to arguments for the so-called selflessness of men to justify men. Arguments towards the hardwiring of men to act a certain way permeate some advocates for men, usually in more religious or traditionalist circles. Not unlike the mainstream conservative who insists that businessmen are profiting purely for selfless charitable reasons instead of unabashedly their own rightful interests, or the Hollywood celebrity that professes shame and forced humility of their own success and overcompensate by adopting one too many children, too many advocate that males are a naturally altruistic creature hardwired for both the provision of women as well as programmatic self-disposal in the name of protecting the weak 
who usually in their minds are again women. I have even heard the term reciprocal altruism thrown about to explain behavior among men and women, including communication, exchange of currency, and basically social interactions in general. I beg to differ vastly from this outlook as it implies a reciprocal action in which neither party derives any gain or fulfillment of self-interest actually happens, uh, while in communication, exchange of money, and practically any given civil free social interaction, this is clearly not the case. Gain is the point of transactions. Profit is about both sides coming out on top after they've, after they've exchanged something. Else, it simply wouldn't happen freely. This is the reason why in my essay, An Objectivist's Case for Men's Rights Advocacy, as posted in my personal blog, I have devoted an appreciable portion discussing the nature of trade. Once again, trade is not mere reciprocity in which the equivalent items get exchanged. Rather, it is about both parties involved in the trade, uh, trading away something of a certain subjectively measured value for something they both value way higher. Else, the trade would never commence, not freely anyway. In communication, the response from the party that an agent desires communication in return is of high higher value to him than abstaining from the effort of reaching out. In terms of monetary exchange, the object to be purchased of a uh, by a client is of higher value than the currency he gives, and likewise the currency the seller receives is of higher value than his merchandise. Even when an individual protects another individual at risk of harm to his person, it is not due to mindless selflessness and abandonment of one's well-being, but one considers the desire to see the object of his protection protected by his own volition, or the potential despair of having let the object of his value die motivate him to act otherwise. Self-interest is about values. Yes, it is about moral values. Morality, long reserved for those that brag of how selfless they are, are truth, truthfully the domain of those that selfishly are honest about their own moral ideas in their limited lifetime. Oftentimes the phrase, live every day as if it were your last, is derided as an excuse allegedly made up by un unprincipled hooligans. But I've always processed it, processed it, it differently. That every day could potentially be your last, and that is precisely why you can't live in a way contrary to your own moral principles, your values in other words. It takes a serious aberration, perhaps socially conditioned, that causes one to betray one's principles in the name of the selfless dogma of pragmatism. I offer instead that morals are very self-generated and a self-interested quality of the human individual. Life is therefore too short not to live in accordance to your values. Do others have a place in your self-interest, your values? If you had to ask the question, then the, at the risk of sounding a bit harsh at first on my part, you probably have been fed a warped idea of compassion as this selfless thing in which your interests are not involved. To answer the question, of course, other individuals do, but not because they are the others. And it never has to be at the expense of your own interests. Compassion and love are selfish things, and that is good. For a man to have his entire sex cast in a way that he must be selfless, that is, never thinking for himself, in order to be, to love or to be compassionate, that, that is beneath him. A man has a right to be selfishly passionate about the people and things he loves, be it his trade, his sports, his games, his entertainment, his ideals, and the people in the life he cares about, in his life he cares about. The next time you complain that a man is being selfish because he is placing himself first, look at yourself instead and try to fathom why you're trying to topple himself off of his own hierarchy of values and place yourself there. Such is the nature of altruism. From August Comte's altruisme, if I'm saying either of those correctly. From alter meaning other. Altruism is literally otherism. And when you demand otherism, upon a man who is going his own way and doing his own thing, usually you're the first in line of the others you want him to instead care about. You're a classic practitioner of what about meism. If masculinity is appraised on the basis of this otherism, masculinity will perish. Masculinity will be doomed. Making the case for men's issues using the argument from altruism is advocacy for men's subjugation and breaking of spirit. What is men's rights if not the upholding of man's whole spirit? I believe in the ability of men to formulate and abide by their values. 
It is precisely this reason that I object to the practically exclusive appraisal heaped upon men in terms of hardwiring and biology that they do the things they do, even those that ultimately destroy themselves. It is heartbreaking to me that biology and dogmatic interpretations of psychology are utilized to serve as apologetics for what I see as men's conditioned, browbeaten behavior to service society, which apparently usually consists of women in these narratives. It is strange to me to see this display of gynocentrism justified, as if such just justification of gynocentrism is the least offensive. Is it that much evil for a male to act of his honest self-interest, in which all he values in this world alongside his own self, as an individual, falls under the things he is invested in? Must we resort to declaring mankind as drones fit only for occasional disposable use, for the sake of princesses that take advantage of us, just to be accepted? Far from debunking the toxic masculinity myth constantly thrown about in the public consciousness, are we not walking on eggshells for their sake, so we pass some massive shit test? Must we not stand on our own two feet? Feminists and the radical SJW left in general seem to be completely on board with the idea that, male, that the male spirit be broken so that men can become weak, pathetic creatures to condescend upon, if not downright wipe out from the human population. It is with great irony that in my recent time as immersing myself in with those that be considered the opposites of that, I've noticed an atmosphere likewise advoca advocating for the disposability of males on the terms of the gynocentric traditionalist. I have said that the di difference between a feminist and a traditionalist is that the traditionalist claims to be thankful when a, ma when a male destroys himself in service. Even among allegedly male-positive circles, the sheer disposability of males is constantly a point of measuring a man's worth. Women, these same women who pre profess to care about male issues and demand more compassion for them, are just as eager to demand male disposability as the men who see masculinity in warped ideas about alphas and chads, as they call them usually beholden to women in their minds anyway. It's not uncommon for me in general to hear about how scars make a man sexy to women. When this video is released, the story of the Bridger Walker injury by a dog will be a few months old, and it will already be roughly two months old by the time I record this talk. But the subject is still fresh in my mind. I'm betting most, if not all of you, have heard this story in which a six-year-old boy, Bridger Walker, stood between his younger sister and a charging dog and was bit several times in the face. Supposedly, he said something along the lines of, If someone had to die, I thought it should be me. This story, as well as the image of Bridger's mutilated, stitched-up face, was circulated vastly in social media to virtually universal praise upon the boy for his selflessness. This story was passed along to Hollywood celebrities, particularly actors from Marvel Avengers, if I'm not mistaken, uh, movies such as Chris Evans calling him so brave in that we need more men like him. Again, praising, praising him for his selflessness, or rather how part of the course it was for him to make himself disposable in actions and in words. If the first words men and women, especially those that allegedly care about men's issues, think of when they see the photo and the story of Bridger Walker uh, is pinnacle of masculinity, so wholesome, a chad, and the most disturbing of all, a real man. We may need to re examine the motives of these people. Whatever it is, it certainly not, is not about men existing on their own terms, but rather on society's terms, to have him as a disposable pawn. I have even heard the argument that it is men, men's duty to protect the weak of society, again assuming that these are largely women in these arguments, but if that were true, how is this argument applied to Bridger? a six-year-old child. His alleged quote, if somebody had to die, I thought it should be me, makes no sense coming from him in any honest capacity. It sounds learned, as if that's what society, society expects to hear from such a boy. If that is the case, what kind of light does this paint us as a society that values a boy by his devaluing himself in favor of others in his own value hierarchy? Hell, it's bad enough that we ask grown men to evaluate themselves in this way. But a six-year-old boy? He gets mangled and uses a dog's chew toy. And that's what it took for a six-year-old to be called a man already? 
We could have seen this incident as a tragic occurrence in which a boy was greatly injured by an attacking dog and in which the sister was thankfully spared. But this spin of the story as an act of heroism makes me suspicious. His relatives went out of their way to boost the story, almost opportunistically, in a vicarious, almost parasitic boost of his team. This makes them glad, practically, to have Bridger injured, not regard him as having unfortunately been so. This constant use of selflessness in the boy's quote, and in the appraisal of, the, of his horde of fans from those on social media to those Hollywood celebrities, begs the question of whether Bridger, Bridger uh, protected his sister out of genuine self-interest or dispassionate duty in the name of selflessness and what society expects of him. Note that self-interest, if at least not yet philosophically contextualized in the mind of a child, is still a pure driving force in a boy before it inevitably, inevitably gets beaten out of him by the world around him, it seems. We will never know now. What would be the implications of this boy, sorry, man's future? His name is now well known enough, I think, as well as what he did this year. Everything he will do of similar magnitude from this point on may be predicated on this incident of heroism. If he fails in his next real-life test of heroism, he will be branded as a pathetic has-been that can't live up to his six-year-old self, even if it happens as soon as next year. Perhaps he'll be rebranded as a coward. If he succeeds, nay, keeps on succeeding in subsequent acts of heroism, the more he will take to heart that it was a social net positive for him to make himself more disposable. He could get himself killed, if at least to be accepted. Social media and Hollywood celebrity, celebrities telling this kid that he is brave and more men like him is needed could very well praise this boy into an early grave. There is a reason why, why those that spout programmatic praise like Chris Evans say we need more men like you. Because men who dispose themselves, themselves by design are high in demand as they keep on, keep on getting disposed of, as a matter of course. Through examples like these, I can't help but notice the amount of praise heaped onto man, male kind in which their sacrifices are the primary, if not the only, measure of male value. Even by those in the men's movement uh, do I notice this eagerness to speak on behalf of men as they strictly give to others at the cost of their very well-being, as, as if to serve as apologetic counterexamples ta tailored for feminists from the dim-witted to the malevolent. One must ask the question of whether a male has a right to exist for his own sake, in contrast to those who think he only has a right to serve as a fatal middleman between a violent agent and a helpless victim that can't or won't defend itself. Why is a male more valuable as a pawn, even a white knight, right for capturing in any given social situation? I spoke before about women supposedly finding scars on men sexy. I've always found that as a bit of a disturbing fetish, that men's mutilation is somehow a turn-on for women, as if the diminished well-being is a criteria for men. Taking this into consideration, is, is it no wonder then that not only vile women and their stupid compliant male pets advocate for circumcision, but that of infant boys with barely days spent in the world that they were born into? Not long after birth, it seems, already a male has to get the tip of his dick chopped off in order to be considered an ideal sort of man. Male sacrifice is a prominent image in Christianity as well, whereas many, traditionalists in particular rather, defend the religious religion on the basis that it gives men a sense of respect and power to fight back against feminine pagan forces. Note that it relies heavily on the mangled, mutilated Christ figure on the cross. Christ's seemingly willing to physical destruction and crucifixion is treated as the deeds of an ideal man. In other words, to be closer to God and be like Christ is good, not despite his mutilation and having died, but because of them. Although I have no wish to be unfair to the religious among us, if Mill Gibson's Passion of the Christ is any indication, with all its introspection on the damaging and torture of Christ, the least they can do is admit that so much of society at large is predicated on this, and that men are asked, if not required, to be like Christ and become sacrificial. Due to this reason, I am sadly not surprised that male disposability is held to such societal standard and expectation. The broken Christ is an adored figure, all for what he lost of himself, so much to the point that this torture is worn by women on their necklace pendants and by men on their tattoos. 
The man who refuses to be crucified is attacked as selfish. He is attacked for not having been broken. He is attacked for having a vision for his own life. Will those who profess to be compassionate for men, boys, and their issues consider for a second that perhaps we should argue for men and boys' autonomy, autonomy from disposability and to advocate for crafting their own individual man for themselves and to love him for it. Somewhat continuing from the subject of Bridger Walker, let's say for a moment that the best case scenario in my mind is true. Bridger took initiative to protect his sister from harm due, due to genuine concern and love. To, to then say that what he did was selfless, or then make, to make the argument that this happened because men are hardwired to protect, is absolutely disingenuous, and to say these things is, is to insult him. It is to rob him of any prospect for having acted upon love. Even he said what he figured probably was what others wanted to hear, regarding that his death is the best case scenario in such a tragic situation. No doubt he would be vilified for having dared to consider his own well-being. What people who confuse compassion for altruism don't seem to get is that one can engage in active protection purely out of self-interest. Again, the desire to see something protected is not in contradiction to one's values. The self is involved, and it's about time we admit that instead of playing apologetics, pretending that the brave do not think of themselves. It is a trade, as if saying, in order to fulfill my desire to see the object of my value be unharmed, I am willing to take the initiative, and I accept the responsibility and consequences should my body be harmed in doing so. This is distinct from... My body is of less or no value, so it must be sacrificed to uphold the other, because they are the other. But this is exactly the basis by which male protective behavior is argued for and praised. Again, the argument of sacrifice. Again, the argument of hardwiring. It is said that men must carry their burden, pick up the cross, and carry it, if you will. But a man's purpose in life is not to carry a burden for its own sake. A man's purpose is to reach his goal the burden being a constraint of the rules and walking the path to this goal. It is said that men must pursue responsibility, but a man's purpose in life is not to pursue responsibility for its own sake. A man's purpose is to take action in response to his values, and he elects to accept the responsibility that comes with it, for, or, which he knows is a requisite for taking the action. It is said that men are hardwired to pursue status. But a man's purpose in life is not to pursue status for its own sake. A man's purpose is to want a better life, a better thing, a better place, and to earn all of that. And he works to attain status and recognition that would earn him that which he wants. Masculinity is about a man's values, not his servitude. Masculinity is about a man's actions, not overburdening himself with responsibilities inherited from others, intending and relinquishing their own responsibilities. Responsibility to the responsible is the best way to go about this. Masculinity is about a man's pursuit of his place in life and the world as he sees it, not his rank by which he's scrutinized by others. A masculinity in which a man selfishly knows what he wants goes out and attains it by truly earning it and accepting the conditions put forth by the rules of reality and nature is a pure sort of masculinity. A masculinity that purely defines itself at, by servitude towards others because they are the others and places himself one in, a, in a position of a sacrificial animal in service to society or the state is a broken sort of masculinity. One can guess which variety of masculinity the feminist and the gynocentric traditionalist alike conspire at the end of the horseshoe to prefer. Free will matters to the individual and most certainly to the man. I warn against the over-reliance on arguments from evolutionary psychology that refer Im immediately to hardwiring and testosterone to explain why m men do what they do, as if their volition matters not. The argument from hardwiring and evolution in such an exclusive fashion can only serve to eliminate both values as a motive for male action and free will as the tool to the end of such an action. I am not saying that the evolutionary and biological arguments aren't useful in context to explain some things about males, in particular in the distant past perhaps, but I ask to strongly consider the fact that humans, men and women, ultimately choose to think and apply their free will. Long denigrated by the likes of Sam Harris as an illusion, free will as a concept is under attack. 
even though the defense is as simple as saying that free will is just the human's capacity to find time to think, even in critical moments, and act in response to their applied values or fail to. To deny the free will argument in advocating for men is to treat them like a mere mindless animal, akin to treating one like a child or otherwise not an adult. If men's rights or anti-feminism is the radical notion that women are adults, like men, perhaps this is a point to consider. I encourage the argument for men and boys based on free will just as much as I do with self-interest. Free will and volition is the means by which the next thing I want to talk about, the competitive male, exercises competitive acts. Testosterone and hardwiring get top billing when it comes to competitive male behavior from male defenders and detractors alike. And sometimes even the defenders speak of con co competition in such a lamenting way as if it is a flaw in the male design. 1. Free will is probably the most important component in a man's actions and especially for unabashed competition. 2. Comp competitiveness is not a flaw in man's design, but an object of awe, admiration, and hopefully love. Allow me to talk next in praise of the competitive male. If I had to define masculinity in one phrase in the simplest way that I can, it is thus. Masculinity is man's pursuit of a value unattainable if he doesn't act. The action of pursuit and attainment, that is, man's initiative to earn, achieve, and otherwise grab the object of his value or desire, is what distinguishes it as a classically male action. It is distinct from a fundamental aspect of femininity, which is the action of selection from potentially many suitors. Man's pursuit of what he wants to attain is given a rather crude, sometimes condescending explanation, that he is hardwired to undergo what he must to attain it, or that testosterone drives them to. Again, as if volition on the part of the man is unimportant. I don't doubt that these elements have some usefulness to explain the evolutionally biolog biological side of things, but it doesn't explain the moral reasons. If we redu reduce men's drive to succeed as merely a biological accident, we are no more closer to adv actually advocating for masculinity than feminists that describe men as animals, potential rapists, or even little more than carriers of venereal disease, as one Christopher Pankhurst put it. The moral argument for masculinity is important because it can give an ultimate context as to why men strive to achieve and willingly undergo what they do. Men want something, be it an object, a place, a partner, even an ideal fulfilled. And he knows that he can't let the things that try to stand in his way succeed. A man of esteem takes this action of pursuit and attainment. If he doesn't realize this, or is unwilling to abide by it, he is in trouble. And at risk of complacency, false contentment, atrophy, and stagnation. It is in a man's selfish best interests to be active and pursue that which he values. He is the happiest in the action of pursuit and attainment, and intrinsic to this action is the idea of competition. Competition is one of the most misunderstood ideas anywhere on the planet, if you were to ask me. Even the defenders of masculinity and some advocates for men, based on my own observations having freshly entered the men's movement, occasionally lament this, uh, the idea of competition as if it is a male flaw. They refer to male competition as an agitation, a struggle implying that it is pathetic, a disharmony, and, sim and similar epithets as that. I have once heard a description by an MRA attempting to use a neurology-based argument in that men's bra brains make them more competitive and men's bra women's brains make them more cooperative, with an obvious bias favor favoring the cooperative female brain and denigrating the competitiveness of men as too individualistic, as if there is such a thing as too individualistic, or if it's in any way a bad thing. The competition and cooperation are not mutually exclusive concepts, and by extension, neither is individualism and cooperation. It takes the individual to form a cooperative. A mantra often thrown uh, about is, there is no I in team, which is absolute bullshit. A team only has eyes. A team that cannot understand the importance of being I is unsustainable. A collective that thrives at the expense of any individual that is a part of it is unfit to exist. A competitive spirit can inspire a male in turn to cooperate. 
Those who denigrate male competitiveness, citing the fact that men fight among themselves, appears to be ignorant of the fact that brotherhood, just as much under attack as competition by feminists and the like, is crucial and natural to men. And only fools ignore infighting among the women, allegedly wired for cooperation, and how absolutely vile and savage those kind of things can get. The competitive aspect of males is targeted with concerted effort by collectivists citing male behavior and so-called toxic masculinity as an actual problem. Former President Obama was succinct in attempting to break the spirit of men who, through competition, attained their businesses, property, successes, and livelihoods. You didn't build that, he says. To paraphrase somebody I know on social media, that is more insulting and offensive than any allegedly cruel, crude thing President Trump has said. The attack on competition is an attack on men being men, and you cannot tr truly advocate for men if the competitive spirit is belittled, mocked, or in any way attacked. Men's competitive spirit must be among the top qualities of men that should be embraced, defended, and loved by men and women alike. Every game, or even any vocation, can be seen as a race towards the finish line. But likewise is every game and vocation a dance that is a fulfillment of what they are by how they play the game and how they carry out their vocation. To be a player of the game, or a representative of their field, they must know how to lose just as well as to win. Competition is not about winning at all costs. This is long the basis of the attack against competition in which the narrative that is that opponents are totally trampled and it is called a dog-eat-dog -dog world, which is of course wrong. Competition is about attaining fulfillment as a competitor. The object of the game, while aiming for the win, is not exactly to win, exactly, but rather to play the game. When you were young, you probably heard the phrase, it's not whether you win or lose, it's how you play the game. And perhaps it didn't make so much sense to you back then, because obviously, one plays to win, right? But the phrase is more profound than anyone gives it credit for. While yes, playing the game is driven by the aim to win, the object of the game is to abide by the game. In addition to being a graceful winner who earned his victory honorably, competition is also about being a good loser. One must ask, do they enjoy the race or are they just in it to win? Do they enjoy the game or do they just play to win? Do they enjoy their profession, their trade, or are they just in it to get rich? I believe I have become a way better chess player than I used to be. And by this, I don't necessarily mean I win every game. I don't. I win some, I lose some. But the difference is in how I play chess now in terms of my character. Every brilliant move my opponent makes, I love and respect. Every blunder I make, I own up to it. This is not altruism. This is not some selfless love my enemy bromide. This is my selfish love of the game as well as a genuine appreciation of other individuals' mind at work as he plays the game with me. The better the gameplay, not only the better when I win, but it's just about as good when I lose. Competition is about losing when I get you next time smile. And I'll be him next time, maybe. I likewise apply this to the game of Magic the Gathering. Whereas I took losses pretty hard in the past when I was much younger, I stopped blaming my opponent for owning better cards and having better skills, and instead work to develop, develop my own, own skills and invest the cards I need to make my de deck work, so long as I keep playing. My gameplay got better, and my self-respect as a Magic player, and the, and the respect I received from others in turn, it all got better, better through my actions and my disciplines. I don't fear a loss against a wor worthy opponent, and winning is all the much better this way in any case. The same can be applied to conduct in industry and in the marketplace, but specifically I want to talk today about the artistic realm, and in more specifically, the music world. Having spent the early part of the last decade in Florida's local music scene, and having been a keyboardist for a band in Central Florida, one thing that I have noticed is the emphasis on supporting other bands versus competing with other bands. Competition is again seen as this antagonistic force about eliminating rivals, when it couldn't be further from the truth. Bands often would, by obligation and etiquette, primarily over any actual interest in the music, support other bands and become friends with them. This is to keep up appearance, mostly, and PR, of course. Behind other bands' backs, I would often hear people saying how the music of the band they just professed to support for sucks. 
to be truthful, as saturated by bands as any given lo local music scene can get, innovation and exciting songs tend to be few and far between. But I wonder, in that case, if the competition would have helped the entire music scene by giving every band a drive and motive to run the race of making the best music they possibly can? Did this alleged spirit of cooperation and mutual support doom them into stagnation? From this analogy of the race to make good music, we can derive an important aspect of what the nature of competition actually is. All participants racing to reach the goal. It isn't about crushing the opponent. Even competition involving attacking the opponent, be it, be it such as martial arts and boxing to tabletop games, follow rules and their goals are akin to racing for first place. When everybody wins the race, at least a good amount of them end up in a better place than they were before. Some may derail due to a mistake, but then there is the next race to get oneself back up. The idea of the safety net, as brought up by anti-competition pundits, who are usually socialists, is largely bullshit and, s and serves only to inter intervene in this atmosphere of competition in which everybody strives to be better than they used to be. Nothing is a better safety net, so-called, than the determination to be better than they used to be. And from this, we can derive for competition a simple but eloquent definition. Competition is fighting against yourself. All competition, ultimately, is that. It's about winning the race at last, or making the goal faster than you did before, while other, allowing other racers to do the same. It's about being a better chess player or card player than you were before, be it a more skilled one or a more honorable one, while allowing, allowing others to do the same. It's about being a better industrialist that can get a product out better than they used to while allowing others to do the same. It's about being a better artist than you used to be while allowing others to do the same. And that is why I've spoken at length on the nature of competition today. Because advocacy for men and boys needs to speak to men and boys' competitive aspects without misunderstanding it, and certainly not by degrading it. If all I have said about competition is true, as well as how intrinsic it is to male masculine action, then to gut men of that is absolutely dangerous. The hardwiring and testosterone at the end of the day is unimportant compared to the moral reason and the self-interested motive for competition. The Japanese have a term in the vernacular that I'm absolutely in love with to the point that I wish the entire world used it, especially in the Western world. That term is makenai. Literally, I won't lose or I'm not going to lose. If anything sums up competition, it's that term, that spirit of not losing not being beat. For a person to say you will makenai to his rival, that is, he won't lose to his rival, is not a malicious declaration, far from it. It is a show of respect, that he is somebody worthy to surpass. But beyond that, it is a call to the self not to lose, to be better than the one he used to be. Nothing says self-interest than the desire not to lose to the person you were up to this point. Competition is the essence of self-interested masculinity. In a world where masculinity is regarded as a toxic plague to be reduced if not eliminated completely, and when masculinity is held in any esteem at all, then it is for utilitarian purposes and how, of how much they give, sacrifice, slave over, toil, and lose for the supposed benefits of society, I offer uh, the argument of men and boys' issues from a self-interest, that is, to value men and boys for being men and boys, for being their unabashed selves, always seeking action, always seeking objects of their desire, and always fighting for their values. To praise them on the basis that they are being altruistic is a complete disservice to men, as if their values and interests do not matter. Too much of what we call a celebration of masculinity is not about men for men's sake, but rather what they do for society, and namely women, and it's not even without a sneaking denigration and mockery of male behavior, sometimes laughing as they make fools of themselves, just for being unabashedly themselves. Early on in this talk, I asked the question, must we not stand on our own two feet? Instead of trying to ultimately appease those that call on male disposability, such as feminists and traditionalist gynocentrists alike, by saying, look at how selfless men are by nature. They are hardwired to give for you. Perhaps we should realize what is meant by standing on our own two feet. It means that we must stop apologizing that men are men 
that boys are boys, and it's to acknowledge that men and boys have a right to live for their own sake. Not as true to toys to be praised for their scars, not as willing victims suppressed by those that intervene in a race, not as mindless agitated automatons that exist to die for society and the state. What men and women should love most about men is what they do and who they are as they act to their own values, as what they make themselves better than the man that he was before in the road to attain the object of their value, as a competitor among many competitors changing the world in their own image, coming out on top strictly on their own terms and respecting each other for doing the same. Standing together on behalf of men and boys is a good indication and symptom of change. But what's important is for each individual man to stand up for himself first. Only then can anybody expect to stand together. I will continue to advocate for men's issues on this basis of self-interest. That is my competition in a field where the argument is often otherwise. If I have persuaded anybody to this point of view through this talk, I am delighted. And in any case, I hope you enjoyed this video and took something for yourself from it. Thank you very much.